Hey everybody, welcome to episode 29 of Dark Matter Knits. I'm Elizabeth Green Musselman, and today the title is More Behind the Scenes Design. You may have noticed that I look a little different today. <laughs> this is going to take a little bit of adjusting, I think. Um, I am recording with my new video camera. I am really hoping. No, I am faking confidence. <laughs> that having an actual camera will uh, make the whole post-production process much, much easier. Uh, and I really want to thank, there were a number of you who made donations to the podcast that made it possible for me to get a camera, and I really, really appreciate it. Uh, in fact, I now have a camera and a tripod. So uh, actually, the, the tripod is thanks to my son, who <laughs> inherited a... Uh, a video camera of mine that does not hold enough, does not have enough memory to record an entire podcast. So he wanted to get a tripod for it, and he said I could borrow it. My 10-year-old was very generous, honestly. It's just, it just kind of cracks me up that he went out and bought a tripod, and now he's letting me use it. <laughs> Anyways, I am hopefully not going to be too loopy today. Uh, I have been put on a dose of five day dose of steroids for back issues by my doctor and it is simultaneously making it very difficult for me to get much sleep and it is making me slightly manic <laughs> so that's an interesting combination and as usual I have to apologize for my wet hair uh, but this is you know Saturdays are busy so this is the best I could do it was either this or be all sweaty and I figured this was better all right, enough with the too much personal information and apologies. Let's get started. So I have a, a thank you to give out today to, I now see, I don't remember if I thanked you last time, Elizabeth, or I did not. Sometimes my notes get a little jumbled. But if I, just in case I did not, Elizabeth, thank you for your donation of the, thank you for your donation of the podcast. I really appreciate it. Um, I also have to, um, I have a prize giveaway. If you remember, we talked about this book last time, Giving Away the Farm by Cindy Telesac. There she is, right there. And so she very nicely gave me a copy of this at DFW, DFW Fiberfest to give away to one of you. And I posted a thread a couple of weeks ago after the last podcast asking you to talk about what you look for in your ideal knitting or crochet group or crafting group in general. And it could either be something that you've already found in a group or something that you wish you could. So I got some really interesting answers to this. Of course, there were many common running themes, but uh, the, the winner who was my Jijo, I think, I'm not quite sure. There was no, the profile didn't have an actual name on it, but she's from Cincinnati. And, uh, and her answer was uh, both a little unusual and very interesting. So she said that, I hope to someday belong to my ideal crafting group. I will soon be moving to a newly purchased home with 16 acres of fenced pasture, begging to be the home of fiber creatures. There, I hope to mirror the philosophy in which Cindy Telesac's, uh, that Cindy Telesac shares in regards to not owning the farm, but being a custodian, custodian of the land where my job will not only run be, where my job will be not only to run the farm but to share it with others a big dream is to offer a fiber studio where folks can gather to learn teach and share their love of fiber and other crafts along with unstructured meetings where one brings their work in progress to enjoy the company of others i would love to have events to learn new techniques and or hobbies the members will be diverse in their abilities and their crafts as well as in the stereotypical demographics it will be a place where everyone knows your name Long and strong friendships will derive over the time one makes stitches. Regardless, if this is a group meeting at my farm or any other domain, it will be a place that all who attend will feel welcome, appreciated, and loved. So that is lovely, and I wish you all the best in getting that started in your new place. I think that's definitely very much in the spirit of this book, so it makes me very happy that I get to send this to you. So I will, uh, I'll wait for you to get in touch with me. Just send me a personal message on Ravelry, or you can contact me by email at darkmatternits at gmail.com, 
and just send me your full name and your mailing address and I will get this to you. And thank you all for, I always, it's always really interesting to me to read your answers to those uh, giveaway threads. They're, they're always very interesting. Hang on, I need to pause this for one minute and look up something, I'll be right back. Okay. I always think I'm being so thorough when I prepare for a show and then I realize as I'm starting to talk that I've forgotten to do something. Got it all sorted. So I have uh, another couple of announcements to make before we get into the heart of the matter for today. One of them is that uh, I was contacted by uh, a woman named Brittany Moonbeam Makes on Ravelry, who asked me to mention to you that she has a Kickstarter campaign going on that is running through April 17th. So there's about another little less than a week for this campaign. And um, the, the basic idea is that she is creating a new line of hand dyed yarns that uh, she sources herself and um, has it custom spun near her home. So it's the idea behind the business is to create a, a line of hand dyed yarns that has as small a uh, ecological footprint as possible, which is a very worthy cause. And, uh, and she's clearly done a lot of research about what's available in her area to make this possible. And her dye work is beautiful. So I did want to mention it to you. Um, I will put a link the, the link is a little long to just, you know, kind of spell out out loud. So I'll put a link to it in the show notes. And I would, uh, if there are those of you who like to support those kind of campaigns, I would certainly encourage you to go look at that. Um, I also wanted to encourage you, if you are already participating, and pro probably a little too late to, unless you knit really fast, to join the Blocari Cap Knit Along on in our Ravelry group. But... Uh, if you are if you're already in process, do go ahead and finish up and post your photos by April fifteenth. That is when I'm going to close the thread, and um, and I will shortly thereafter announce the winners of the prizes that I showed last week, and I'll make sure to make a brief mention of it. Well, will I talk about it on the next podcast? I may or may not. We'll see, uh, because by then I probably will have already mailed off the prizes, so I'm not sure it will really make a whole lot of sense to re-announce it on the show, but uh, if you are interested in who wins the prize, I'm just going to do a random drawing. So go ahead and post your, your photos of your finished hats in the thread, and I will make sure to account for them when I'm uh, tallying up, you know, drawing for the, for the prizes. <laughs> Don't know why that was so hard. All right. Um, what I am knitting, I am still working on my honey cowl because I have mostly been doing work knitting. But this is leisure knitting. This uh, yarn is a little, a little greener than it's showing up on camera. It's showing up a little bit too blue. It's really more of a true turquoise. Uh, this is the White Bear Fiber Sport Weight that I showed on the previous podcast. You can see the honey cowl's gotten pretty big. It's about eight inches now in depth. The, the pattern says to go for 11 inches, which seems awfully wide to me. I mean, I think it's, um, when, when you see it styled in the photographs in, on online, uh, people are, they, they, it tends to kind of double up either here or, you know, kind of flop down this way. So I think what I want to do, this is my second skein, and each skein I think has about uh, 240 yards in it maybe, maybe, no, more like 300 yards. So I think what I want to do is stop pretty soon. I think I'm actually on my last row and then I'm going to bind off um, because I want to use, I want to make a matching hat. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be able to use up all of this on the cowl. So I thought I would stop a little early since I like this depth anyway and make, there's a, there's actually a hat pattern online, but um, I think I'm just going to make up my own version of it with the same, with like some ribbing, along the brim and then switch over to this, uh, that slip stitch pattern for the, the body of the hat. Um, you may remember I talked about last time constantly messing up this pattern. For some reason that has stopped. I haven't really had that problem since I think I've kind of gotten into a rhythm where even if I'm not paying that much attention to the stitch pattern, it kind of, um, I can, I've got a sort of uh, muscle memory version of the rhythm now where it's like 
pearl slip, pearl slip, pearl slip. So it doesn't, uh, I don't get off quite so easily, even if I'm not fully focused on it. So that's good. <laughs> it's been going along a lot faster since then. And it is a lot longer than this. It's just a little bunched up because this is the length of cable I happen to have handy. Um, is there anything else I want to say about this? I'm working it on a size six needle. You're actually supposed to use DK for this pattern, but uh, this was a fairly thick sport weight, it seemed like, and it's a cowl. You know, it doesn't really particularly matter whether the gauge is, is thought on or not. And to decide how many stitches I wanted for the hat, I'm literally just putting this on my head. <laughs> and until it's on and then kind of stretching it until it feels like, okay, that's not gonna constantly slip down over my eyebrows. Taking it off. See, I've got it pinched right here. And then I'm just counting how many stitches across that is. Cheapers, that looks big. I have an enormous head. <laughs> I think my head is like 24 and a half inches or something like that. So I'm just counting, you know, how many stitches is that across there, and that's what I'll, that's how big I'll make my hat. And now I've got yarn wrapped around my neck and hair all over my desk. Well, I am a hot mess right now. So that's what I'm working on. That should be done by the time I see you next, and I will probably have the hat started. And I'm thinking... I'm kind of getting in the mood for something, in terms of my leisure knitting, something a little more complicated. So I'm thinking about either, well this one wouldn't be too much more complicated, but just ever so slightly, uh, the Pennon Shawl by Anna Clark. Uh, she sent me a copy of that pattern and I'm really intrigued by it. It's got this really cool, unusual, uh, triangular construction. It's shaped more like a pennant than like a, a traditional triangular shawl. So more like a, it would, it would, it would be, you would wear it more like you would a crescent shaped shawl than you would a traditional triangular shaped shawl, if that makes sense, because it's really uh, a long kind of isosceles triangle. Or I'm thinking, and this would really be ramping up my technical level, <laughs> maybe one of Andy Smith's two color cable projects. Uh, also a friend of mine who sent me a copy of those patterns and I really, really love them, and they look fun to knit. Or, maybe because I've been watching too many episodes of Sockmetician, I might try some double knitting. I have actually never tried a double knitting project before. Wow. I know. <laughs> There's actually, a, there are a number of kinds of knitting that I've not tried. Uh, double knitting is one of them that feels somewhat shameful to me. Um, Entrelock, not so much, because I'm just not in love with the style as much, but double knitting I really like. It's not as practical here in Texas, but still. You know, you can work it in sport or fingering weight, and it'll be fine as far as thickness goes. So I'm thinking I might give that a shot. Uh, oh, I hate it when people do that. The And I, I'm starting to do it. Ooh, I've got to stop doing that. Let's take a drink of water while I ponder my errors. I know that drives some people nuts too, so that's not really helping, is it? <laughs> okay, the heart of the matter today, I have two things to talk about. And some of this just has to do with the timing worked out well, but also uh, I, I, I'm talking about why I'm talking about these things. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about kind of behind the scenes design type stuff because a lot of people responded really positively to that when I've talked about it in previous episodes. So, and it just happened that there were a couple of things that were timely today that fit into that category. So I thought, let's go ahead and do that. So, uh, two things. One of them is, one of the things I want to talk about is a review of some software, an app, an iPad app that uh, I was sent to review. And, uh, it's a really interesting app and I, that I'd like to show you briefly and give you some idea of how it works, just in case you might be interested in, in taking a look at it. Um, and the, the app developers have very kindly offered to do a giveaway of an a annual subscription, a one-year subscription to the app. So that is very cool. And then uh, 
I also want to talk about a about doing photo shoots for knitting and um, because I for the first time directed a photo shoot for like I've, I've taken photographs of my own knitting and, and so on but I've never actually been in charge of a massive photo shoot with dozens of projects so uh, and the book just came out that I did the photo shoot for so I thought it would be interesting to talk about what I learned from doing that photo shoot and you know I made a number of mistakes despite all of my preparation so even if it's something that you never end up doing yourself I thought it might be interesting to hear about it like what goes into one of these uh, photo shoots for a book of knitting projects so let's start with the pattern genius software the you may have heard of in fact, you probably have of, a, of an app called Knit Companion, which is an iPad, an iOS app that uh, is really, really cool. It is, it basically allows you to take a PDF of any knitting pattern and you import it into the app and it allows you to, it's, it's especially nice if it's got charts because what it allows you to do is uh, keep track of where you are in the chart, even you can even place, this is one of my favorite features, it's just a, like a small feature, but I think it's really cool. Uh, it allows you to put on the chart where your stitch markers are. So no matter what the pattern has told you, like most charts don't have stitch marker placement on them, right? They just tell you in the written notes where to put them. But you can actually put uh, a little note on the chart that will track as you go up where your stitch markers are so it's easier for you to see uh, you know where you are in the chart with respect to your own knitting very cool and there are lots of interesting features in it but it's it's basically really nice for helping you keep track of where you are in a pattern and keeping notes about what you are doing you can highlight your size for example all throughout the pattern so you know the stitch counts for your size etc so that's Knit Companion. They just came out with a new app called Pattern Genius, which is a chart making app. So if you are somebody who wants to make a chart, this is a, a good app for you. So let me go ahead and open up Pattern Genius so you can see what it looks like. There is a free version, and this is what I have received, is a you know a kind of scaled down version of the larger app and um, it basically looks like this. So what, what opens up when you open up the free version is a empty grid. I've already started drawing some, some little icons in there, or some symbols, I mean. And you're, in the, um, you're deposited initially into the project section. And what you can do, I mean, the basic cool thing here is that it's got some pre-existing symbols in here and in the free version you've got to use those. Whoops, I have apparently tapped something weird. Stop it. Grandma's oh, birthday. Oh no. Let's go, everyone. No. Grandma. No. <gasps> oh. Shh. Okay, that's better. I don't know what was I must have tapped on some ad or something. Okay, so there are all these pre-made symbols and in the free version those are the ones you get. In the paid version, you can make up your own, and, and there's a more expanded library of existing uh, symbols. But you tap on what you want, like let's say I want to use, I want to draw a purl stitch. It's got the dot and the dash, depending on which one you want to use. Those are both accepted symbols for purl. And the nice thing is that when you tap on it, let me see if I can do this fast enough so you can see, it tells you that's a slip one. I just tapped on the slip one symbol, or I tap on this, maybe I don't recognize it, that's a purl one through the back loop. So it tells you what the symbol is, and then it's got it highlighted in red, that purl one through the back loop. And then as I tap on the screen, I can put in the symbols. I wonder, I haven't tried this yet, I guess I, I, guess I would need to tap the empty knit stitch and tap it again to erase it. So really cool and um, you can you can see up here at the top there's 
the basic version, there are increases and decreases. So when you switch, you get a whole list of increases and decreases. So there's quite a bit of symbols in here, even in the free version. Um, you get elongated stitches. So when you're, um, well, I don't know, <laughs> whatever. Texture, cables, there aren't a lot of cables in here, but there are some. Presumably there are more in the paid version. And color work. So you can choose one of the colors and like, let's say I choose this. Nope, I gotta upgrade to color. <laughs> I have to upgrade to the paid pattern. Um, So yeah, apparently for color work, you would have to actually uh, use the, the paid version. But um, for symbols, if you wanted to do any lace, especially lace charts or kind of simple knit pearl patterns or, uh, or cabling, simple cabling, you could use the, the free version. And it's just kind of nice. I mean, I think really what the free version is is just a way of kind of testing this out to see if you like the interface. If you're really going to make charts, you probably need the paid version, which, by the way, is um, it costs sixteen dollars a year. Though it works similarly to Knit Companion, where you're you're paying for a yearly subscription. It's not a one-time fee. It's uh, it's a yearly thing. And I should also say that this is only for iPad. I mean, I've, I think I've kind of implied that as we've gone along, but. And I know they've gotten a lot of complaints about this with Knit Companion. It's just that, um, and I, I believe they've just recently developed an Android version for um, for Knit Companion. It's just, it's a huge amount of, it's a two-person company, and it's a huge amount of time to develop it for a whole other uh, interface. So that's why it's happened that way. Um, there are all kinds of cool things that in the paid app you can do, like... Um, in the, in the larger version, you can uh, copy and paste whole sections. So, you know, if you think about it, a lot of charts have repeats that you could just copy and paste over instead of having to draw them over and over again. You can also mirror things. So, you know, if you think about a, a cable, you could, you know, either flip it up like this or, you know, flip it out like this so that, again, you're not having to you know, just draw in every single individual symbol. So it's real. It's a, a really good app, and you know there are other chart. There is other chart making software that you can purchase. Um, I think if you if you really enjoy working on a tablet, and you know when I think about when I'm designing, I often I I don't like being at the computer when I'm designing. You know when I'm. I'm typically kind of knitting and writing down. I tend to hand write out my notes as I'm going along and I often hand draw my charts as I'm as I'm knitting up the sample. It would be nice to be able to draw a chart on a tablet instead of having to be at my computer but also not have to transcribe it, you know, from like I don't want to sit at my computer and knit, but it's also kind of a pain to have to hand draw the chart and then come over and transcribe it into Illustrator, which is what I use for charts. So um, this is a nice, you know, kind of middle ground where you can get a professional looking chart, but not have to sit at your computer at the same time. So I really like that. And, you know, it occurred to me too, that this is the kind of thing that might be really useful, even if you are not actually planning to design anything yourself, because um, you may, for example, want to just draw up your own chart to do a hat or, um, you know, make some changes to a chart and, you know, kind of redraw it out for yourself. Like maybe if you're changing the gauge on something and you want to eliminate a column, a couple of columns of stitches to, you know, kind of narrow, make narrower the hat or something like that, uh, you could use this to kind of personalize an existing chart to you know, make your own stuff. So it's, um, I think the interface is really intuitive. It's pretty clear what each of these buttons is supposed to do. And um, yeah, I just, I really like the way 
it's written. You can, um, in the in the paid version, you can make the chart larger or smaller. In the free version, you're just stuck with the number of stitches and rows that it's got on it. Um, you can also push a button to get row numbers and stitch numbers. Again, the, only the paid version has, only the paid version will allow you to move the even numbers over, like if you're doing a flat chart, you know how you'll have the wrong side row numbers over here and the even, you know, like that kind of thing. So yeah, I mean, I really think if you're, if you like the free version, you're almost certainly gonna want to upgrade to the paid version. So that is, it's called Pattern Genius, and if you just go to, if you're interested in checking out the free version, uh, go to the uh, Apple App Store and from your iPad and just look that up, Pattern Genius, it's all one word, and, um, and check it out. And thank you to Sally for, Sally Holt, for sending me a copy of the pattern to try out. Uh, she has, as I mentioned, offered to give away one free subscription. So it's a one-year subscription to the app. And the question I'm going to pose to you is, what are some of your favorite features or pet peeves when it comes to charts? So, and I would just ask that if you if you are going to, to enter to win this, um, like, like really do have a some idea of how you might want to use it. Like, again, you don't need to be a professional designer or anything, but I'd really like for somebody to win this who thinks, I really would like to use this. So it, we don't need a whole lot of, you don't need, you know, a huge number of people to enter. I don't, I don't feel bad when there are only 20 or so people who enter to win something. What I like is when somebody wins something and I think, oh, they're really gonna, they're really gonna get a huge kick out of this. Like when I was at DFW Fiberfest and Diane of the Suburban Citra podcast won one of Franklin Habits lace patterns, and I thought, now she is actually going to knit that shawl. <laughs> you know how you, sometimes people win stuff and you're like, they're never going to use that. Like you know them, and you know like the, the prize just totally doesn't fit them. That's always a little sad. Okay, so the other thing I want to talk about is, uh, is about photo shoots, and specifically the photo shoot for this book, Defarge to Shakespeare, which is edited by Heather Ordover, who many of you know from the Craft Lit podcast. And uh, I was the, I contributed a design to this book, and at the time that this book was uh, being produced, I was the book designer for Cooperative Press. I'm no longer doing that, but uh, this is one of the last projects that I've wrapped up with them. And so I did all of the the layout, but in addition, what I did for this book that I hadn't ever done before was I also did the photo shoot. So it was a really interesting process to go through. I wasn't the photographer, so we hired Caro Sheridan, who uh, has done a lot of professional photography for for the knitting community, and uh, and she, in fact, if you, I, I would highly recommend her craftsy class about photographing. Um, crafts for it's especially useful if you're doing any kind of craft product photography like if you're a knitting designer or make any kind of jewelry or you know sell any kind of craft products online it's a really good class on how to take good photographs of what you make so so Caro Sheridan was the photographer she flew down from Toronto where she lives and and then we had uh, several models who, well, they're not professional models, they're actually former students of mine, the two women who did most of the modeling for the book. Uh, one of them had graduated recently and the other uh, probably about a decade ago, and uh, Brianna and Emily, and they did a wonderful job. Um, so what I was doing was basically kind of acting as the the stylist and organizer and overseer of the shoot, and I did all of the research to decide how to set up each of the shots. And I, it was a, it was really interesting to me how much research it took to make all this work. I mean, part of it was just the logistics of finding the right place and the right time, right? So we had a photographer coming in from out of town, uh, two models, and we needed a place and we needed it to be reasonably certain that it was not going to be, you know, a terrible weather, which in Austin, 
I mean, we get about 300 days of sunshine a year. So, you know, if, if you're going to be able to find a good day he, anywhere here is probably a good bet. But still. So I found this, because this was Shakespeare themed knitting, right? I thought, I was trying to think, you know, what would be a good outdoor location? Because outdoor lighting is usually optimal for shooting knitwear. What would be a good outdoor location that kind of bespeaks Shakespeare, right? So there is a an outdoor theater that is owned by the city. It's right near one of the uh, the swimming pools. It's the Zilker Hillside Theater. And they perform kind of Shakespeare, free Shakespeare plays outside in the summers. So I thought, well, this would be perfect, right? And there was a whole, you know, kind of logistical rigmarole to go through to get permission from the city and all that. And it turns out, I'm really glad I called instead of just, you know, kind of going through the online process. Because when I called, they said, oh, well, if you're if you're doing a, a photo shoot for, you know, kind of a small organization, we have this whole other separate process where you don't have to pay a huge amount of money. It's a fairly nominal fee, actually, if you're doing, a, you know, kind of small scale photography or, or filmmaking. So, you know, it ended up being a lot cheaper to rent this place than I would have thought. Um, so the day comes, or, well, actually, no, I guess the, the, the other thing I want to say is, be, again, because this was Shakespeare inspired knitwear, I was trying to think about, okay, what kind of props do I need to bring? How do I want to set up each of these photos so that they make sense with the inspiration that inspired the design in the first place, right? Because each one is inspired by a character or a play or a scene from a Shakespearean play. So I didn't want, you know, like, I didn't want shots of the stuff inspired by Macbeth to be humorous or flippant. You know, I wanted them to kind of look tragic and, and to have props and styling that seemed to fit the inspiration. So it took a lot of work to pin all of that down and to keep it from being becoming overly complicated. So let me show you some examples of how this worked out. Um, luckily, in the case of this one, this is a teapot cozy called the Fairy Queen Tea Cozy, inspired by Midsummer Night's Dream and by Alex Alisi and Cassandra Devers. Luckily, they actually sent a teapot. So they had designed it to fit this teapot and they just sent the teapot. So I didn't have to go scrambling around finding a teapot that would fit nicely into this cozy. They already had it in the box with the sample, so that was nice. I also, um, I wanted, I didn't want this book to appear stodgy. You know, I think one of the tricks with something like this is that people don't actually go around wearing Shakespearean gear every day. <laughs> well, maybe you do, but, you know, apart from dressing up for the occasional Renaissance festival, uh, you kind of need to convey the fact that like, I both wanted to show the inspiration for the piece, but also make it clear that these are pieces that you can wear just in everyday life, right? So Emily, who is modeling the some of the Malvolio stockings here, uh, Malvolio from Twelfth Night, she uh, brought these wonderful kind of combat boots looking, and I thought they were great with, and this cute little uh, black short skirt that she was wearing. It looked really great with Chrissy Gardner's yellow stockings. And that same pattern repeats down the leg, so it doesn't end up being a problem to cover them up there. We also, uh, <laughs> I ended up modeling a few things, uh, partly because we ran out of time on the day when the other two models could be there. And partly because, uh, because I mean, we were shooting something like 36 or 40 different pieces. I mean, there were only 29 designs in here, but several of them had multiple samples. So it was just like, it was a huge, huge thing. Um, but in this case, I specifically modeled this because this is Heather Ordover's pattern, The Taming of the Shrug. <laughs> obviously inspired by Taming of the Shrew. So there are two versions of the pattern, one knitted with worsted weight, which is what I'm wearing, and the other knitted with lace weight, which is what Brianna is wearing. And um, 
they're inspired by the two sisters from Taming of the Shrew, Kate and Bianca. So we wanted to, you know, kind of do some comedic <laughs> poses where I'm doing Kate the Shrew and she is she is being a uh, sweet Bianca. I had to borrow some props. This is a, a wonderful folio of, uh, of Shakespeare's plays that one of my neighbors actually let me borrow. I put out a, I was a little, getting a little desperate, and uh, so I put out a, a note on the neighborhood. No, I, I put a note on Facebook asking if anybody local could let me borrow a nice looking book of Shakespeare because we needed it for these bookmarks and a few other shots. So my very lovely neighbor, Claire, let me borrow this wonderful book. Cause these, it's called Prospero's Bookmarks, so we have it open to the Tempest. I also borrowed my son's plastic snake <laughs> for this uh, Cleopatra-inspired necklace by Beverly Army Williams, which I just think is lovely. It's a, uh, it's hairpin crochet. And I mean, in a, in a way, the, the plastic snake is a little bit cheap. I was worried it would look cheesy, but it actually looks pretty great. And Emily just happened to bring this stunning red lipstick, which ended up being perfect for the drama of the, the shot. And I love this other one of her smooching the snake. <laughs> Some of this was serendipity. We found this tree that had handprints on it, which looks great with these mitts by uh, Becky Green, the Sonnet 73 gauntlets. The yellow's not really looking great on camera, but... This was a really hard shot to get. Uh, this is called Desdemona's Handkerchief. It's by Natalie Servant, and depending on the weight you knit it at, it can either be a blanket or a handkerchief. In Othello, uh, a lot of the drama hangs on the fact that Desdemona drops a handkerchief and uh, Iago is able to frame her by uh, taking the handkerchief and planting it somewhere else. So in the shot, I wanted to try to show the handkerchief falling. We must have tried about 30 times to make that work and it just never really quite worked, but at least this shot kind of... Uh, allows you to see the piece while also suggesting that moment in the play. It's really interesting with these photo shoots, like you've really, you want to tell a story at the same time that you have to show the technical details of the piece. So, you know, most of these photo shoots you'll have like what are called the hero shots, which are kind of less about the technical details of the shot and more about the story. And then you'll have these close-up shots that give you more of a sense of the construction of the garment and its details so that, you know, if you have any questions about the instructions, you can kind of see it in the photograph. This one, uh, a sweater by Mari Chiba inspired by Macbeth, which is really lovely. It, um, that, this was really embarrassing to me. I somehow managed to put this on the model backwards and uh, it was just a logistical issue where Mari had sent in instructions about what was the front and the back and I never got them. So it was just a, just a mistake. But I ended up, this is actually, if you're really paying attention, you will notice that Emily in other shots, let me see if I can find a good one. Yeah. In other shots, she has hair that is down past her ears. And in this shot, she has a pixie haircut. <laughs> That's because this is almost a year later. Uh, and it took forever to reschedule this on a day where the lighting was similar, et cetera, et cetera. And when she was available and I was available. But we got it with the sweater on the correct way. I was so proud of myself because I had, I had to take this, these photos. Uh, Caro, of course, you know, we couldn't afford to fly her back down from Toronto to, to do the shoot again. So um, I was really proud of myself that I managed to get photos that I thought looked like, looked like they fit with the rest of the photos in the book. I also love that uh, Emily has this beautiful butterfly wing 
tattoo on her back and I love how it shows over the top of the sweater here. She's got such a great fairy pixie look about her. Let's see. This is another one I want to show you because I was really happy about the props for this one. If you know anything about Titus Andronicus, oh my gosh. If you are squeamish, do not ever watch that movie. <laughs> it has, um, oh, Anthony Hopkins playing Titus, I think. And, oh, it's just a terrible play. I mean, it is tragedy writ large. It's horrible. The things that happen to people in this play are horrible, and the way it's depicted in the movie is very graphic. Um, without getting into too many details, Lavinia, Titus's daughter, is treated abominably, and on top of everything else that happens to her, her hands are cut off, and she has left to... Yeah, she's left with her hands cut off. And in the movie, she is shown with branches uh, in place of her hands. So, I know it's really grim. So, for Lavinia's gloves, also by Mari Chiba, I had her holding, this is Brianna again, I had her holding dead branches as a kind of allusion to that moment in the play. I also really like the staging for this one. This one I planned out ahead of time also. Ophelia's Watery Scarf of Death. <laughs> by, again, by Alex Alisi and Cassandra Devers. This really pretty, wispy shawl with little flowers that you attach. Obviously inspired by Ophelia from Hamlet. So it's supposed to look, you know, very watery with, you know, as if she's floating in the water um, at, her, you know, the moment of, that she offs herself. So I wanted to, to show that kind of watery nature of the shawl. And also um, suggest that, is it Malay? I think it's a late 19th century, very famous painting of Ophelia floating in the water. So uh, that is what this picture is about. The pillow, I feel a little bit bad because it just kind of, it's a little bit distracting but it was a pillow in my car. Uh, poor Brianna was so uncomfortable lying on these rocks that uh, I did it as a mercy to her, even though it does uh, kind of detract a little bit from, from, this, from the shawl. I am too soft-hearted, what can I say? I also bought these flowers specifically for Ophelia's Garden Mittens uh, by Rosemary Cox, because in Hamlet, Ophelia uh, before her death uh, is handing out, in a famous scene, it's handing out flowers to people to kind of chastise them for the way that she's been treated. And um, so, obviously, those had to be pictured with, with flowers. Last one I want to show you. <laughs> so a few, uh, a few of these shots I had to do separately because, um, either because of timing or, uh, in this case, because uh, I didn't want to try to have to schedule a baby during, you know, on a day where we had all these other shots going on. So this is actually a separate shoot that I did with Ezra, who is uh, the baby of, a, well, he's now a toddler, but baby of a friend of mine. <laughs> just think he's so cute. This uh, sweater is Exhumed Pursued by Bear, which is a uh, stage direction from The Winter's Tale. And uh, she made this Amy Tiskowitz, I think is how you say her name. Uh, designed this really cute little baby vest with bare ears to uh, inspired by that line and uh, Ezra was it is such a I know I knew from watching his pictures on Facebook that he's constantly smiling and looks adorable in all the pictures that his moms take of him so I thought this kid's gonna if a baby is ever going to be easy to photograph this kid's gonna be it and sure enough he is and right there next to him I uh, just to kind of give him something to play with. This is actually a free pattern that was given out to people who pre-ordered the book uh, called We Will, designed by Donna Payton. It's a Shakespeare doll that looks like Shakespeare, so I kind of tucked him in the book to, partly to give Ezra something to play with, but he immediately dumped Shakespeare on the ground and then started smiling at his mom. <laughs> Whatever, that works too. So yeah, um, 
the whole process was really interesting. And I guess what I would say is, uh, as far as lessons that I learned, number one, it is a really good idea to have one person who is doing, if you're going to be shooting more than one knitted piece or crocheted piece, uh, have a person who is doing taking the photographs and then have a person who can be doing all the other stuff. Putting pieces on and off the models, uh, making sure that the sleeves are, you know, not twisted and that everything's lying straight, that there isn't, you know, hair or a leaf or something stray that has gotten onto the knitwear, uh, making sure that everything is on correctly. You want to have, you want to prepare a whole sheet of notes, even with, you know, really stuff that you wouldn't think you would need to note down, like make sure to take a shot of the sleeve, make sure to take a shot of, you know, what the shawl looks like on upside down because that looks cool. Like take all of those notes and put them down on a sheet of paper that you print out and take with you because everything happens so fast that you're going to need that. I also, and here was something that I didn't know in advance, if you have that many things, bring a bin, like a giant bin that you can just dump everything into. I had all these bags and stuff wrapped up and in, in Ziploc bags to keep everything straight, and uh, and there just wasn't time for that. Like, it just needed to be dumped into a bin and sorted later. Um, I also learned that, I kind of knew this ahead of time, but it, that actually a cloudy or partly cloudy day is a lot easier to work with than a directly sunny day or you're going or at, at the very least if you're going to be ne needing to shoot for a while a cloudy day is easier to deal with if not if you just have a half hour to an hour of work to do go really early in the morning like right after sunrise or as the sun is going down so the light is really indirect and not you know just glaring on the on the person that you're shooting um, and bring lots of props. If people have stuff to do with their hands, they tend to be more relaxed. So, and it provides a little extra interest in the, in the shot. And I think, yeah, I think that's, I mean, there's more to it than that, but I think that's, that's probably enough for now. It was, it was a really interesting experience. I'd like to do it again. Um, I don't do the photo shoots for the business that I, I do now, Stitch Definition. My partner, Anne, does all the photo shoots for that, but I'm, I'm doing one with her this summer where my stuff is being photographed and she's running it. So I'm really curious to see how she does those. She is the person who organizes them and then she hires a photographer to take the photographs. So I'm really looking forward to watching her work to see how she plans all of this stuff. I believe that is it for today. Oh no, I need to do my technique segment. What I thought I would talk about today, since I had talked about uh, drawing charts, is um, is how to, it's a little bit about how to read charts and how to feel more comfortable with them. I know a lot of people, even very experienced knitters, really don't like working with charts, that they much prefer written instructions and find charts really difficult to manage. which is something that I've never, never really felt, but I kind of understand it. And here's one of the things that I think a lot of people struggle with. It's that, particularly if you're working on something where it's flat, so you're not working in the round, you're working back and forth. Uh, one of the difficulties is that, of course, the, a chart shows you the right side of the work. So when you're working the wrong side rows, it can be really confusing because you are like what looks like a purl stitch on the chart is actually supposed to be working worked as a knitted stitch. So let me explain a little bit about how that works and why. Um, I'm going to use the chart from, let me see if I can find a, a simple one that will not give too much away. From this book. Okay, let's take something like this, right? So here you are, you start on row one and you purl one, knit one, purl one, knit one. That's all fine, right? Because you're just 
you know if you've ever read charts that you're knitting from right to left, so you read from right to left as you work across the chart. And the little row number tells you start over here. The problem comes when you get to row two, and now you're still looking at the right side on the chart, but on your knitting, you're looking at the wrong side, right? So in order to produce that stitch, something that looks like that on the right side, you've got to flip everything around in your mind. So here, here's how I think about it. And I'm, I don't even think I really realized I was thinking about it this way until I started thinking about talking to you about it. Imagine that you could actually step around behind this chart and that you could see it almost like it was drawn on a, on a piece of glass or clear plastic and that you could see it from behind. And you know, if you've been knitting for a little while, that a purl stitch is basically a backwards knit stitch. It's just the reverse side of a knit stitch. So imagine looking, you're looking at this from behind, from back where I am. What do you need to do to produce something that looks like that on the right side of the knitting? Well, I need to, I need to do a knit stitch because if I'm going to get a purl bump on the right side, back here, I need to be knitting. So I'll knit one, purl one, in order to get what looks like a knit stitch on the other side. Knit one, purl one, etc. And once you get going, I mean, really it only takes me like maybe the first couple of stitches and then, you know, typically you can see a pattern develop and then you can just kind of chant in your head as you go along without having to look at the chart. So that's how, and usually, I mean, in the vast majority of patterns uh, of charts, the wrong side is largely knits and purls. I mean, most of the time that's the case, right? On In many lace patterns, you do all the complicated stitches on the right side rows, and then going back, it's, mo it's usually knit the knits and purl the purls. So that's not too complicated. Um, and on cables, similar thing. You do all the cables in almost every pattern I've ever seen. You do all the cabling on the right side, and then going back, knit the knits and purl the purls. Uh, with knit, knit and purl texture patterns, you might have to pay a little more attention because they might be something like, you know, seed stitch or whatever. But if you just follow that idea that, you know, just imagine seeing the chart from the other side as though it were drawn on a piece of glass, what would you have to do to get your knitting to look right on the right side? You're working over here. What would you have to do to get this side to look like the chart? That's how you have to kind of flip it around in your mind. I hope that's helpful to some of you. I mean, it gets, a lot of these things that I say might seem blindingly obvious to many of you, and it's probably what you're already doing, but enough of you have told me that that is not the case for you, that I will keep saying these things. <laughs> um, I believe that is all from me today. All right, I am... Cross your fingers with me that this will be a blissful editing and posting experience. <laughs> All right, I will see you in a couple of weeks when I will be a year older. Dun, dun, dun. All right, take care, sweeties. Talk to you soon. Bye.